Hi, Ivan. How's it going? Very good. Very well, Michael. So our topic today is the House of Lords, which Labour has been promising to reform for about 100 years. And um, I think what Blair managed to do was allow women to wear trousers and allow the guy on the Queen's speech day to turn his back on the Queen, which he wasn't allowed to do before. But now he's about 75. He thought he might fall and break his neck. So he was allowed to turn his back on the Queen. So when you look at the House of Lords, don't you think it's like Blade Runner or Star Wars now? It's quite a bizarre institution if you actually sit down and think about it and look at it from a logical point of view from the 21st century you think what is this all about what are these clowns playing at it really needs just to be swept away and replaced with something that's fit for purpose it's uh, symptomatic of the establishment and the way that power works in the uk and it really really needs to go I mean, the SNP's policy has been quite clear all along. Sturgeon said recently she would abolish the House of Lords, and the SNP have never taken a seat in the Lords, whereas there's a big difference here with Labour, who have promised to abolish it, they've promised to change it, they've tinkered around it, but they will take seats in it. And, the, you know, we've had people like George Fulkes who's promised to change it from the inside. I wonder how that's going for him. Yeah, a waste of time and a complete load of nonsense. I mean, you could argue that there is a place for a second chamber and you look at models around the world where they've got democratic second chambers and that, that could, be, could be valuable. Although, interestingly, many countries of Scotland's size and some bigger ones as well have only got a single chamber process and provided you've got uh, robust committee stages and processes for scrutiny of legislation and that, that works fine. So you could look at a model for a directly elected second chamber, which is perfectly possible, and there's lots of different ways you could do that. But the structure as it is at the moment, complete and utter nonsense. And if you move towards a federal system, maybe there's a role for it as a UK federal parliament, and that could be some kind of role, but it needs to be totally democratic, significantly reduced in size, and get rid of all this um, historical nonsense that surrounds the place. So let's um, go through that, because I'm sure most of the listeners will understand that. In case someone's not too sure about it, let's talk about the makeup of the House of Lords and how it's appointed. Yeah, there's more than, I always count, more than 800, probably even more than that now, uh, members of the House of Lords. It is, I believe, the second biggest legislative chamber in the world after the Chinese... Central Committee, and as they say, they're not they're not elected. They're some are hereditary still. Most are appointed, which really feeds into the whole patronage situation. If you keep your nose clean and do what the party wants you to do, or donate to the party at the right uh, the right level, then over time you um, gravitate towards a seat in the House of Lords. And once you're in there, you turn up when you want, do what you like, get paid for turning up. I think three hundred pound turn up for, for ten minutes attendance or whatever, if you feel like it. And that's pretty much it. Now, I'm sure there are folk in there that do work and contribute, but the vast majority don't. And the main point, though, is the whole process is just such an anachronism. It really is ridiculous in this day and age. I can even go one further. It's an extreme example, but it is highly possible that there are people in the House of Lords voting on United Kingdom legislation who are there because, I don't know, just to give an example, it's possibly or even probably true, their ancestors killed someone for the king 600 years ago. Um, Well, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's That's the way it works. It's quite absurd in this day and age that you could have someone like that Having real power, because if you think about it in a Scottish context, just for a moment, recently the House of Lords took back a power from the Scottish Parliament to Westminster about uh, renewable energy, uh, clean energy. They certainly did, that's absolutely true. So it shows you that they do have an impact on legislation, there's no doubt about that. Um, And getting legislation, controversial legislation, to the House of Lords is always a consideration for a government. So that's important to recognise. It really does have a role at the moment in terms of government, which isn't um, a healthy place for us to be. To finish up on this, do you feel it really does reinforce an outmoded and unhealthy class system and deferential attitude that people in the United Kingdom still have to a certain extent, even if they don't realise they have it? Yeah, no, it does. Of course it does. There's there's hard facts of who's there and how they legislate. Then there's all patronage things sitting behind it in terms of how the people have got to stay in line in order to get to that stage. But as you say, it also does reinforce this whole perception round about who's entitled to be an authority and who isn't, which is um, not something that's really fit for purpose in a modern European country in the 21st century. Thanks, Ivan. Thanks, Michael. Talk to you soon. 
Michael's asked me to take a regular look at the best of the, well, shall we say, terminological inexactitudes our politicians have been spouting as the squabble for our precious votes becomes ever more frenetic. We've already had some crackers in the campaign so far, and don't worry, it'll be only a matter of time before we hear from the usual suspects. But for today, I'd like to start at the top and focus on David Cameron's appearance on Sunday's Andrew Marr show. Being interviewed by Marr is like being mugged by a blamange, so you rarely get the chance to show off your core skills. But even so, Dave rose to the challenge and produced a 15-minute masterclass in tetchiness, obfuscation, bribery and downright scaremongering. It included the following brazen but completely unfounded assertions. 1. Food bank usage, roughly 62,000 per annum when the coalition took office, had shot up to a mind-boggling 1 million because, wait for it, the Tories had considerately begun the practice of advertising food banks at job centres, and not because the Department of Work and Pensions was being run by an incompetent psychopath. 2. Despite mountains of damning evidence, Dave wasn't too feared to debate with ordinary folk, but was in fact the only party leader out meeting the public. This will be news to the extraordinarily gregarious Nicola Sturgeon, and even to Jim Murphy, who may spend his life surrounded by rent-a-crowd placard carriers, but still finds time to yell at pensioners in the street. 3. Surprise, surprise! A post-election deal involving the SNP, who didn't care about England, Wales and Northern Ireland and didn't want to see our country succeed, would be calamitous and frightening. Labour, Dave claimed, were already planning to cancel road projects in the south of England, presumably because the SNP's chief fixer, Angus Robertson, had threatened to break their knuckles if they didn't. This obsession with the SNP turned out to be the main theme of the interview, which is, let's face it, pretty pathetic even by the Tories' recent shoddy standards. Naturally, it featured heavily in the ensuing Twitter storm, including one tweet from none other than Jim Murphy. Yes, that Jim Murphy. Dave may have won today's prize for telling porkies, but when it comes to unintentional irony, there's no one to touch Ur Jim.